All right, my name is Thomas Graf. I work for Reddit as an engineer. Uh, I want to make next couple or next 20 minutes a bit more of a discussion. So I only have a couple of slides. Um, the overall topic is trying to, to move some of the OES performance problems to, to make them a harder problem because uh, it's always easier. Um, first of all, I would like to define a problem statement. Um, as you all know, OES puts all the uplinks into promiscuous mode in order for it to receive all packets. That uh, has the side effect that if the network is full of, of non-relevant traffic that is, is not relevant to, all, to any of the VMs running uh, on an OVS switch or not behind any of the tunnels, that means that the, the, the virtual switch has to process all of those packets in software. Um, and software is always, is always slow. It also means that each new flow, as we heard from Jerry before, each new flow is actually a miss and will hit the slow path. And the slow path, in case of, of OVS, has been slow. It, is, it has been improved um, dramatically. Um, Multi-threading helped a lot. And Megaflows helps a lot as well. Uh, I don't have numbers yet on Megaflows, but as uh, Jesse pointed out, that seems to have um, solved a lot of the problems already. But as I said, considerable resources are spent from processing flows that are not really relevant to the, to the virtual switch. So what we did, we tried to benchmark it. And as Tom pointed out, we don't care much about um, single flow or bulk traffic. We care about a, lo a lot about um, the, TC the, the TCP CRR net perf use case as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be HTTP. It could also be SIP or any, or any other UDP-based traffic pattern where you don't have the typical TCP handshake first that would cause the, 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 the flow maze with no payload to the, to the to user space. But in fact, the first packet would, 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 uh, would already carry payload. So what we did, we have an OVS switch and two 10 gig ports attached to it. The first port is actually saturated um, using packet chain, using randomized flows, maybe 50,000 flows per second or something like that. Um, packet chain easily, is easily able to, to, to generate 10 gig traffic for that. Um, we used 128 bytes. That means the opcall is not that expensive. Even though there's a, there's a software copy going on, it's not that expensive. But it still, it, it still puts a lot of load on both the, the, the flow table and the opcall. The second uplink actually runs an HTTP benchmark. Um, we did not want to run a single NetPerf um, use case because that would mean that you would only have one flow cache miss, and after, after, that, after that miss has been served, you would only ever hit the fast path, and you, you're, you're, essentially not, you're, you're essentially not using the, the flow table anymore or, not, or, or, or only, in the, uh, only in the fast path. Observation, um, the, general, the generic netlink opcall is still the bottleneck, specifically um, the locking thereof. And multi-threading helped a lot, but it's still, it's still the, by far the slowest piece in the whole um, machine. The reason why multi-threading helped a lot is because it no longer puts all the load on a single core. Previously, you would see, typically see on a, on a, on a six-core machine, you would see, typically see one core uh, utilizing 100% of the CPU just running OVS, and it would not be able to keep up. Multi-threading helped that because it spreads the, the, the cost of the slow path across all cores. So that's, that's great. That's, that has reduced the, the, or has improved the performance of OVS under call it a DOS or call it normal use case pattern, has improved it a lot. The result um, is still 40% packet loss on our machines. That, that number is pretty random, depends a lot on what kind of hardware you're, 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 you're running on. But fact is, if you have two, two uplinks, one, two 10 gig uplinks, one is saturated with random flows, you're not able to, to, um, to use a second one and run a HTTP benchmark without packet loss, which is something you would expect from a switch. So what can we do about that? First of all, any questions on, on the problem statement? Is, is, it, is, it, is it clear to, to everyone, more or less?
the context switch. Yeah, that's a problem as well. That's a problem as well. But typically, we saw like uh, when you run perf on those machines, we saw about 50% of the CPU cycle should spend on the generic Netlink lock. Basically, user space is, is waiting, is, 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 is uh, synchronizing all the, um, all the requests. Basically, on the Tangic link running package gen, every packet received there results in a, in a, um, results in a netlink up call. So, in a message sent to user space, and the lock, lock needs to be taken there. So, if, if, you, if you have multi threading, you can spread it load across multiple CPUs, but obviously, you're still hurt by the cost of, of, the, of the locking of that netlink. The packet loss is basically just because the machine is overloaded and can, cannot handle it anymore. The packet is dropped at the receive side in the, inside the NIC. Yeah, the so user space performance, OBS user space performance is fine. OBS uses almost no CPU. It's actually the locking that the CPUs are waiting all the time, and, and all this waiting causes not, n not enough CPU uh, cycles to be made available for the NIC to receive all the packets. Yeah, then there is obviously no, no problem if you have a single flow. It's, yeah. This one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right, that's, that's like the next slide. So you are already, uh, yeah. Uh, it's multi-core, so it's spread across all cores, basically. Uh, it's it's, it's multi-queue, it's spread across all cores. Other questions? Well, I would like for this problem to disappear so we don't even have to solve the scheduling problem. Um, if we can solve it at the conceptual level and 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 don't even need the locking, for example, then we don't even have to optimize it. If you can make the problem, problem uh, disappear, we don't have to solve it. So the first, the first solution, and most of you have already probably seen the patches, was to try and optimize the, the op call. Obvious one was, was avoid the copy. Eric actually gave me this idea in Denmark a couple of months ago. I tried it out. The problem is OBS has this weird dependency on the netlink total la message length needs to be aligned, which is horrible for zero copy up call because if you have a packet size that is not aligned to eight bytes, you will need to reallocate SKB headroom uh, to, for, for, for in order to the, the complete netlink message length to be, uh, to, um, to be aligned. It's, it's very, very unfortunate. I think it's a, a small bug in the OBS netlink code which was, which was not noticed so far. You would all, typically, you would not see it unless you want to use uh, zero copy methods. So that's why it's, it's not possible to do that right now. Second approach would be to use memory map netlink. It's a feature that has just been merged upstream a couple of months ago, I think two months ago. It would dramatically reduce the cost of copying the packet to user space because the copy is no longer needed. Um, problem with that is it's not backwards compatible. It's, it, it, the existing user kernel interface would need to be changed and it would need to be a backwards compatible way. It would need to fall back to what exists now. So it's, it's, it would be nice, but it would only work for um, future versions of OBS. We have a proof of concept patch ready. It's almost functional, still fletching out the box. Um, I would like to repeat the disclaimer r right here that not all of this work is my work. Other people inside Reddit are working on this as well and other upstream people. So I'm just collecting, from, uh, collecting solutions. 
We have PF Ring, which is part of the NTOP project. Maybe some of you are familiar with that, which is very similar to what uh, Luigi uh, presented in the first slot. Um, obviously, that has that is very fast. It, it improves the performance from getting packets kernel to user space dramatically, but it also means it's not compatible with whatever exists, and it bypasses all security system and models that are present in host operating system. So that, that may apply or may not, may not, may not apply. Um, what we tried out is using the, the Intel-based uh, five-tuple um, filters to try and uh, only copy the packets to user space that are actually interesting to us. So instead of copying everything to user space, we, 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 we tried out to, to limit the scope of what we copied to even cut down the cost even more. Um, but that's, that's currently specific to a specific uh, network card, so we're not, we, are, we haven't pushed any of that upstream yet. Um, ideally, basically, instead of, instead of copying everything user space, you define whatever MAC address by, 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 um, by a MAC list, by a list of MAC addresses, and by a list of, of uh, five tuple fillers, you define of what what, are, what, what flows are actually interested to OBS in user space, and then you only copy up those packets. So one, one thing that I think should be considered if we're copying full packets in user space, um, these are not just in, they can be packets Right. Well, that's what's happening right now anyway, right? So OBS requires a full, full copy of the packet right now. So, we have, so when, 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 when an up call happens right now, it copies the full packet. Yeah, so if we can get out of that and maybe have a little bit of computer in the kernel, but if the user space only sees the part that OBS needs, it should only need to have it. Right? Well, I guess, I'm not sure you can correct me, but I think OpenFlow allows you to pretty much match on any bit in the packet, right? Uh, Theoretically, it's... Okay, so it would be possible to limit the scope of what we include in the upcall and. I think Luigi had another question. Sorry. No, I haven't, we haven't tried that, but that's an, that's an interesting idea. I think that's something we want to capture on the ETH pad, matching up up calls. Yeah, we run perf, and it's 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 spinning, waiting on the generic netlink socket lock mostly. So it's the synchronization cost of netlink messages up to user space. That's what we found out. It's a mutex, I, I think. Yeah. No, it's a it's a different. Actually, we um, prorate. I'm not sure if prorate. Uh, he fixed, uh, he changed OVS generic netlink locking dramatically in the last release, so it changed a bit. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a separate OVS lock now. It's
Yeah. Well, we saw about 50% of the cycle spent on that lock. So that's pretty much, well, it was obvious that it's not worth spending any effort on anything else until, until that is fixed. Basically, otherwise you, you introduce reordering, but that's a different problem because we are, we are, already, we are seeing reordering. Yeah, you could do that. Well, Netlink, Netlink, the pro Netlink protocol would typically serialize every message because it would, it would think that messages need, need to be kept in order. But for OBS, it would not matter, in fact. So maybe it's an option to, to generalize or to extend generic Netlink to um, make it possible to not serialize messages. Yeah. Yeah. It's, n it's not an architectural problem, it's a Netlink cost problem. Netlink was not made for this to, to a large degree. Again, I didn't understand. Serialized uh, packet push to user space uh, when you are using multiple cores to draw the packets from the data plane, from the interface. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Okay. The packets are coming from the NIC, and OpenVis switch is using multiple cores to pull the packets out. Yeah. But you need to push it to user space for or using Netlink for in this case, right? Yeah. How do you serialize that the packet order is maintained when it goes to user space? <clears throat> well, there is one 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 mutex per socket. Oh, that's that's the bottleneck now. Yeah. Um, that's what we just discussed. That so that 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 mutex, yeah. So that okay. mutex may not be required after all because we do not necessarily care about um, serialization of these messages. Yeah, right. So it's 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 guaranteed that the same flow always is in the same queue. That's actually an interesting point because we have seen a lot of reordering with OVS because when when the packet hits the flow table for the first time you generate up calls all the time until the first top call re-injects the packet back. And at that point, you will start using the flow, the, the fast path only. But you will still have all the packets that came in between the first hit and the, the last hit, they will be re-injected and they will actually be reordered. So we'll, you will actually see every couple of seconds, you will see every time the flow cache is cleared, you will see a reordering of about 10 packets or so. So that's not a problem to tackle. Yeah, no. Yeah, the five tuple match stuff. Actually, um, what we did use was PF Ring, which is um, open source code, part of the NTOP project. We did not necessarily look into um, how PF Ring does it. We just want to try out the idea of, of what kind of performance benefits the, the idea gives. I would, I would suggest that you contact one of the Intel folks um, with a question. Yeah. You mean um, how to implement the software fallback, basically? Yeah, I, I guess you could do that. You could, you could, for example, use a Bloom filter to emulate something in software, for example. Um, obviously, that would be required if, if we ever decide to, to merge something like that. Obviously, not all of the network cards would, would uh, provide the necessary features, so a software fallback of some sort would be required, obviously. Oh, we can spend all the time on this slide. It's, <laughs> Tom will. I actually have four, but I was just planning to spend to cut off whenever we finish. Yeah, we are going to. So then we're going to get into more hardware details next. So the second idea was to avoid promiscuous mode, and that's where hardware gets into play. Um, Yeah, 
It depends extremely on, on, your, on your network. If you have a smart switch in front of you, you're not seeing a lot. It depends a lot of your traffic pattern. And, and in the worst case, you can always create this scenario and, 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 and flood a machine with what, which, what uh, appears to be non-relevant flows. So we, OBS needs to be able to handle it. Um, some of you might have seen the patches from Vlad and Michael for the bridge, which, which utilized the, the Mac-based the Mac filtering capabilities of a NIC um, to turn off, to be able to turn off promiscuous mode for bridges. Uh, so the, the bridge would only receive multicast, uh, all multicast traffic plus all packets directed to a specific list of MAC addresses. Um, for bridging, that's simple because it does not really understand the concept of SDN. For OBS, it's a lot more difficult because you might have tunnels, uh, you might have port mirroring. Uh, you're not, not quite sure what upper layers require. So it, it needs a little bit more of thought. Um, therefore, it conflicts with the SDN concept to some degree. But it's still possible to apply that, that optimization um, if it is in line of what the, 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 the logically centralized controller requires you to do. And I guess that's the part that still needs to be defined, how to, um, how to have the controller let you know when a local uh, virtual switch can, can apply this optimization concept or not. Um, the problem with that is that filtering slots on these, on these cars are pretty limited so far. Um, I'm not sure about the actual details, but it's a couple of thousand. That's not enough um, or may not be enough. It could be enough, but it might not be enough. So it, again, a softer fallback is needed. Any questions or ideas on that? Well, basically, the hypervisor knows when he starts a VM and when he stops a VM. And so he will, the hypervisor will update the Mac filter whenever a VM is started or stopped. Yeah, so typical libword would be doing that kind of work. Yeah, that's a good question because not all VMs will be limited to one MAC address. But there are specific use cases where your VM will always only listen for one MAC address. Use the mic. Uh, sorry, I don't. I don't understand you um, acoustically. To deal with nested virtualization, if within the KVM you are running a LXC container, would the hypervisor be aware of all the uh, MAC filters to program? Using Linux, Linux containers, you mean? Yeah. If you. If you are running a KVM guest, okay. and within the KVM guest, you are running Linux containers. Oh, inside, so inside, inside, the, inside right. the VM. Yeah, so the, the VM would be, would be required to report the correct list of MAC addresses down. That's, 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 that's only fine. So this is at the level of a concept right now. It's um, obviously whoever deploys the VMs needs to know what is running inside this VM. If it, if it can't know, what MAC addresses are, 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 are of interest for the VM, this concept would, would not apply. So it's not a general purpose um, applies in all cases concept, but it's, it's an optimization for, a spe for specific well-used use cases.
And um, in this regard, the, the upcoming 40 gig and 100 gig NICs will have extended filtering capabilities. Actually, there is a talk, I think it's actually happening now on, on 100 gig NICs coming from Intel. Um, but that's certainly something to look into. The 10 gig NIC filtering capabilities are quite limited at this point, but 40 gig and 100 gig NICs will have new features, and some of them I apply to OBS in a, in a, in a, in a perfect match. Neil. My question is, uh, how much performance do you think this is, or, or how much of a performance increase do you think you'll get by actually being able to disable promiscuous mode? I ask the question because it seems like even in a multi-tenant environment, um, with a lot of the more modern SDN technologies and even a well-laid-out VLAN, I, I'm not sure that you expect to get a whole lot of traffic that isn't already bound for you anyway. That's right. I mean, in typical case, it will almost be zero percent. The problem is if you're not ready to handle it, you're very vulnerable. You're, you're um, um, vulnerable to, to any kind of network con uh, any kind of network defect that, that causes a traffic pattern that, that and it will essentially um, cause all of the virtual switches to, to shut down, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. It's a, it's a scalability issue, pretty much. Yeah. Right, that's, that's right. So I have two more slides, and um, we're not going to discuss them, but I'm going to show you them and spend one minute. So if you want to discuss those with me in the hallway, you can do that. So I just want to share the idea real quick. One is splitting a flow table, and that's making use of the, the RX hash of the NIC. It doesn't, it's not needed that we have one big flow table, but we could actually make use of the fact that the queues running uh, or the cores running um, Packets of specific flows would only apply, or those, those flows would only need a partial view of the flow table. So we could possibly split the flow tables into multiple, uh, the, the single flow table into multiple flow tables and use the knowledge that, let's say, on queue number two, only um, specific flows are seen and we will, never, we will never see all of the flows. So we can make use of that and limit the scope of, of, of each flow table. That also has the has um, advantage on a NUMA system, we would never ever access the flow table on a remote memory node. So it will also improve local um, memory um, um, locality. And it's optimizable through the flow director or the 5 tuple filter mix. And yeah, that's a bonus slide. <laughs> um, that's a large topic, so I'm not going to even get started on that. All right. Thank you very much.